Yarn. Yarn number three. Not exactly legal. The housemaid interview. I'd been on the receiving end countless times, but this was the first time I'd be the one doing the interviewing. I set up a rigorous schedule to see six candidates one Sunday, only one of whom showed up, the very last candidate of the day. By the time Vincent arrived, I was suffering from a combination of cabin fever and desperation. At first glance, he came across as the quintessential East London hipster. In his mid-twenties, he was tall, had an unruly red beard, and topped the look off with a trucker hat. I showed him up the stairs to the small two-bedroom flat. In a shy, soft-spoken voice, he thanked me for seeing him and immediately complimented the flat. Nice flat. He politely removed his hat to reveal an immaculately groomed haircut and nervously brushed his slick back hair with his hand. Can I get you anything? Water? Tea? Beer? This was my first test for the right flatmate. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, a beer, please. He passed the first test. I'm from Brighton. Just moved to London recently. Started a plumbing apprenticeship up here. But what is it you do? Uh, I'm a graphic designer. Oh, right. So you're good with computers? Wouldn't know too much about that, me. After about half an hour of pleasant and uncontroversial chat, I saw him out. Cheers for coming, Vincent. Uh, I'll get back to you in a couple of hours. I'm letting everyone know tonight. I doubt Vincent realised how good his chances were. He ranked number one out of a field of one. I offered him the room and he moved in the next week. On move day, as I helped carry his possessions up the tight staircase, one item stuck out. A massive canvas, about one metre by one metre and a half. It took quite a bit of effort to negotiate the bend in the stairs and through the door to the flat. It was only when we got to the open area of the living room that I made out what was on the canvas. It was a painting featuring a montage of the greatest moments in the life and career of the boxer, Chris Eubank. The central image depicted the boxer lifting his various world championship belts. This was surrounded by smaller images of Eubank fighting famous opponents, an image of him sporting his trademark bowler hat and monocle, and images of Eubank the father with his four children. Its garishness stunned me for a couple of seconds. I thought you might appreciate that, seeing as you're a graphic artist. It's by a famous painter from Brighton. It'll be worth quite a bit in a few years, let me tell you. What do you think? It's, uh... I grappled for words. Any words, but none were coming easily. So you like Chris Eubank? I settled on, finally. Oh, yeah. He's Brighton's most famous export. I've seen all his fights. And his son, Chris Jr., trained in the same gym as me when I was a kid. That's Chris Jr. there. Vincent pointed out one of the four infants surrounding Eubank in the painting. They were all dressed in white and seemed to be depicted as cherubs. Nice. Uh, So do you still box? Oh no, not anymore. I was pretty good back in the day though. I sparred with Chris Jr. a few times, but I I don't fight anymore. Boxing seemed like as good a subject as any to bond over, so each evening I'd steered the conversation that way. This usually led to Vincent describing a famous Eubank bout and then saying something like, You want to watch it? They're all on that YouTube website. Stick in Ben V. Eubank, WBO middleweight, 1990. That's a good one. After that, we can see if it's got the 1993 rematch. If you want. Vincent had a surprisingly limited knowledge of technology. As far as he knew, YouTube was just a boxing video archive. He had no other obvious use for the internet. He didn't have a computer and only used a basic feature phone. I wasn't even sure if he had a bank account. He said he got paid in cash and he hand-delivered a wad of banknotes to our landlady each month. Vincent and our landlady shared the same aversion to the tax man, so she didn't seem to mind his cash deliveries. They were definitely kindred spirits. If we bumped into her in the hallway, she'd always have a quick announcement to make. Oh boys, just a quick one. If anyone from the council calls, don't say you live in a flat. This is a house of multiple occupation, not an apartment building. I'm just going to take your flat number down off the buzzer. One evening, Vincent and I were watching Eubank versus Ronaldo dos Santos. Eubank knocked him out in a total of 20 seconds, including the count. Vincent explained what was happening as multiple angles and slow motion replays expanded the original 20 seconds into 15 minutes. Wanna go for a pint? 
Yeah, why not? After about two rounds of beer, a tipsy Vincent began to fill me in on the details of his short-lived boxing career. I was a bit of a naughty boy. The boxing I did wasn't exactly... legal. What do you mean, like, uh, bare knuckle? He nodded slowly and took a sip from his pint. Vincent grew up in a suburb of Brighton called Whitehawk with his mother and his younger brother and sister. The Hawkers was a pretty tough spot, so I joined a boxing gym when I was a kid. I wasn't much good at school, so finished straight after my O-levels. Got a job as a bouncer for a few clubs down around the seafront. I met a lot of interesting characters in that job, let me tell you. The characters he referred to were members of a local gang. They were interested in Vincent's specific skill set. They needed someone to help collect debts and be on hand for important deals. Someone who wasn't afraid to negotiate with their fists is what they were after, if you know what I mean. His new job of chief negotiator slash enforcer brought a lot of money and quite a bit of local notoriety. Oh no, my old mum didn't like it one bit. She kicked me out of the house, wouldn't even let me see my little brother. I didn't care though. I had a brand new BMW, a sick flat on London Road and a fit bird. A yoga instructor from up Moosley Mountain. I had no idea what Moosley Mountain was. Where did the bare knuckle boxing come into it? Oh, yeah. Well, the fellas I was working with ran the book on some underground fights. They set me up with a manager and got me a few fights. I was doing about two a week at my peak and earning a mint. Were there any rules or weight divisions? Uh, no, not exactly. There were rounds, but the only way to win was by knockout or if the other guys threw in the towel. That didn't happen very often. If you gave up, you'd have to deal with the angry mob who had thousands riding on you. The fights were literally underground, usually staged in sweaty, overcrowded basements of clubs and bars in prosperous areas of central London. Bouts didn't start until the dead of night, long after the club's surface-dwelling patrons had trickled out onto the streets in search of kebabs and taxis. But you got out. Eventually. Unhurt? Uh, not exactly. I'll never forget my last fight. Well, what I remember of it anyway. <laughs> uh, my manager, Billy, called me up late one night. I know this is short notice, mate, but how would you be fixed for heading up London tonight for a fight? Someone's dropped out, and there's a gap in the card. It's a big money purse. So, I said, who am I fighting? And he said... Some new kid, I think. His first fight, you'll pound him. Billy helped me out in a few um, situations in the past. He knew I owed him one, so I did it. Vincent and Billy took the late night drive up to London. They arrived at a Mayfair club and were directed down a tight concrete stairwell and into the cavernous underbelly of the building. The room was already heaving with activity. The previous bout had just broken up. Officials, if you could call them that, were attempting to clear the makeshift ring. Men threw bottles and jeered at a limp figure in the middle. As the loser was dragged off, a cacophony of voices shouted insults in English, Russian and various other Eastern European languages. Vincent's fight was up next. I wasn't too worried until I saw the fella I was fighting. He was a monster. Look, Russian. Most of the guys I fought were Russian, or somewhere like that. That or they were pikeys. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. We were shitting it when we squared up to each other. He was banging his chest so hard it started to bleed. His eyes were the scariest. He was obviously on speed or coke. I never touched any of that shit, just so you know. The fight kicked off and the crowd erupted. Vincent was pummeled straight away. I knew there was no way I was beating this guy. He wasn't even feeling my punches. I felt every one of his, let me tell you. As the round dragged on, Vincent struggled to cope. His whole face was swollen. Most of his vision was obscured by black floating dots. He didn't even have the energy to hold his hands up and throw a punch. The end of another round sounded. A brief respite. Billy, I'm done, I said. I give up. You can't, he told me. We won't make it out of here. I've guaranteed a lot of guys over there that you'll win. They're in for a lot. I don't remember much after that. I remember being on the deck, people crowding around and kicking me. 
then being in the back of a car, then being rolled out onto the street. Billy managed to get Vincent out of the club. He drove him all the way back down to Brighton, where he dumped him on the doorstep of his mother's house. That was the last time I saw Billy. My mum and sister found me that morning. My face was so bloody and swollen that they didn't recognise me at first. They were going to call the cops. He woke up the next day in a hospital bed. I had to eat through a straw for the next few weeks. My jaw was wired shut. The worst bit was that I permanently lost all my vision in my left eye. Just as quickly as Vincent had accrued his fancy flat, flash car and flexible girlfriend, he lost them all. I decided I needed to start fresh, so I moved up to London and found an apprenticeship, answered your ad for a flatmate, and here we are. I was slightly concerned to hear how recent Vincent's criminal past was, but it seemed to be behind him. He was living a new life, pursuing a new career, and started going out with a new girlfriend. They met one night when Vincent was drunkenly walking home from the pub. I came across this girl shouting at a tree. Turned out her cat got spooked and wouldn't come down. Vincent volunteered to retrieve the cat, almost breaking his neck in the process. It was dark, I was steaming drunk, and as you know I can only see out of one eye. It's a miracle myself and the cat got down in one piece. Well, two pieces. (laughs) If I was sober I would have just kept walking. Luckily for him, he didn't. Vincent later found out that his new girlfriend was the heir to one of Britain's richest antique dealers. Her father didn't much like the tax man either. He was currently exercising non-dom status in Andorra. I wonder sometimes if she's just going out of me to piss her dad off. I'm a bit of rough, I guess. I was at work late one night, when I got a call from our landlady. She didn't beat about the bush. Listen, when was the last time you saw Vincent? I had to think for a second or two. Uh, I don't think I've seen him all week, actually. And I was on holiday the week before. Why do you ask? So you haven't seen him since you got back? That's two weeks. Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose. She was starting to worry me. Has he told you that he's two months behind on the rent? No, he hasn't. That's pity. He should have let you know. Can you try and contact him? He might actually answer a call from you. If he's having trouble, maybe suggest he borrow some money from friends or family. I tried calling Vincent's phone. The number you have reached is not in service. I didn't have much luck getting a reply to any of my text messages either. Had he done a runner? I'm pretty sure that's what our landlady suspected. When I got back to the flat, I called out his name. No response. The enormous Eubank painting still dominated the living room. I knocked at his bedroom door a few times, then slowly pushed it in. His possessions were still there. His bed was unmade and his clothes strewn around the room. If he was going to abscond, surely he would have brought his stuff with him. Thoughts of his previous life of crime replayed in my mind. What if someone from his past had caught up with him? I shot off another text message. Vincent, I'm worried about you. Please let me know you're okay. It dawned on me that besides his phone number, I had no other way of contacting him. I didn't have a number for any of his friends or family. I didn't know where his girlfriend lived. I didn't even know her second name. Should I report him as a missing person, I thought. I decided to give him 24 hours to make contact. After that, I'd call the police. I picked up my phone. Sitting on the screen was a message from Vincent. Hi mate, sorry I haven't been in touch. Heard the landlady's been giving you a bit of grief. I'll sort it out with her when I get back. I've had a bit of a nightmare couple of weeks. My brother died. I instantly felt like a complete dick for even thinking you'd skipped out on the rent. The message went on. I've had a lot to deal with, as you can imagine. Organising things and talking to the police. I'll be back in a couple of days. Look forward to having a pint and a chat. When he finally returned to the flat, we greeted each other awkwardly. Want to go for a pint? Our short walk to the pub was a lot more sombre this time. As soon as I placed a pint in front of him, Vincent started talking. He was stabbed outside one of the clubs I used to bounce. Vincent's mother had a near miss with her oldest son, but she wasn't so lucky with her youngest. The police don't seem to be too bothered catching the bastard who did it. Everyone knows who it was. He's just hiding out somewhere until this blows over. If I found him, I'd kill him. It was the first time I'd heard real anger in his voice. We stayed at the pub until closing. The next day I struggled through work nursing a very heavy head. I was relieved to get home. 
I collapsed on the couch and aimlessly flicked through TV channels. It was only then that I noticed it. The Chris Eubank painting was missing from the wall. I pushed Vincent's door in again. It revealed an empty room. This time, I was sure he wasn't coming back. This has been a story for YarnPodcast.com, written and narrated by John Roach, with the voices of Joe Jameson and Claire Taylor. Performances directed by Josh Roach, and original music by Kieran Dunphy.